Welcome to the Wanderers History Podcast and to the second half of the episode where I talked and summarized Stanley Kubrick's Napoleon script. We ended with the triumphant moment of his coronation in 1804 at Notre Dame, which confirmed his absolute power. Before we continue, I'd like to remind you to please make sure you hit that subscribe button so that you never miss any new history material from this podcast. Let's continue. After the coronation scene, the script would take us to a new scene finding Emperor Napoleon at an exquisite dinner, dessert being served at the time, and Napoleon offering his opinion on the French Revolution. Napoleon would say, quote, The revolution failed because the foundation of its political philosophy was in error. Its central dogma was the transference of original sin from man to society. It had the rosy vision that by nature man is good, and that he is only corrupted by an incorrectly organized society, destroy the offending social institutions, tinker with the machine a bit, and you have utopia, presto. Natural man back in all his goodness. End quote. Laughter echoes at the table, and Napoleon continues, quote, It's a very attractive idea, but it simply isn't true. They had the whole thing backwards. Society is corrupt because man is corrupt, because he is weak, selfish, hypocritical, and greedy. And he is not made this way by society. He is born this way. You can see it even in the youngest children. It's no good trying to build a better society on false assumptions. Authority's main job is to keep man from being at his worst and thus make life tolerable for the greater number of people. To this, Monsieur Triot replies, quote, Your Majesty, you certainly have a very pessimistic view of human nature. Napoleon, in turn, replies, quote, My dear Monsieur Triot, I'm not paid for finding it better. End of quote. Here we have a concise philosophical view of how Emperor Napoleon saw the world, the corrupt nature of man, and what the role of the state was in keeping the worst of man at bay with authority in order to preserve and for the betterment of society. It is followed by a cold conversation between Napoleon and a very jealous Josephine, only for them to reconcile. Everything gears up towards the war with Napoleon's old enemy. The narrator steps in and sets the scene, and the script reads, quote, Since the year 1069, France and England had been at war for a total of 152 years, and from 1338, the kings of England also called themselves the kings of France, until Napoleon obliged them to drop this title at the time of the short-lived peace Treaty of Amiens in 1802. In the following year, England again declared war on France and the conflict between the British and French imperialism for maritime supremacy and world power would now be fought to a finish. End quote. The narrator would continue, saying that Napoleon devised a plan to lure the British fleet into a wild goose chase to the West Indies, leaving the channel unprotected long enough for the French to ferry their army safely across. But the scheme was poorly executed and eventually led to the disastrous naval defeat at Trafalgar. However, everything transitions to a milestone of 19th century European military history at Austerlitz, with the script reading, quote, A cold, blustery day. A large fire has been built at the base of a steep-sided gully. French cavalry vedettes are posted at the top of the hill. A party of 50 Austrian hussars escorting three imperial carriages comes to a halt. Drummers and trumpeters sound a salute. Napoleon helps the defeated Emperor Francis of Austria from his carriage, embracing him with cordiality. (laughs) 
This is the first meeting between Napoleon and an important European monarch, end quote. This segment about Austerlitz represents a combination of dialogue and narration, the narrator stepping in often and giving an update on the state of events as we progress along in the movie. For example, the narrator says, quote, having ruined the Austro-Russian alliance by her neutrality, Prussia proceeded in the following year to commit suicide by taking on Napoleon single-handed. Followed by the narrator saying again, Prussia would make the same strategic error that Austria made in the previous year, and she would overconfidently rush forward to meet the French alone, without waiting for their Russian allies. In seven days of fighting, the Prussian army would be virtually destroyed. Everything moves towards the 1807 Treaty of Tilsit, and we see the interior of the Tilsit Salon during the day. Napoleon and Tsar Alexander I leaning on their elbows on a large map of the world, spread out on a table. The narrator proceeds and says, quote, Alexander had come to treat as a fallen enemy. There would be not territorial demands, no reparations, only an intoxicating proposal to divide the world between them. Very interesting dialogue exchanges take place between Napoleon and Alexander, and then Napoleon, sitting in a steaming bathtub with Talleyrand going over clauses of the Treaty of Tilsit, at times in disbelief in what terms were agreed. They then talk about England, its reliance on Austria for any hopes of sustained war against the French, and the role of the Russians in all of this. The chapter ends on fanfare at the Niemen ri River, Napoleon hugging Alexander, telling him always to deal with Napoleon directly, so as advisors and ministers to never muddy the waters. The scene fades out, and we get a new chapter title called The Fall, which begins with Napoleon and Josephine in the imperial throne room. Napoleon stating that he needed an heir to continue his legacy, and he was unable to be provided one, by Josephine, who's sobbing while reading a divorce statement. Napoleon is described as being pale and shaken, an indicator of what is to come. The narrator tells us, quote, On the day after the divorce, Napoleon drove to Malmaison to visit with Josephine, and this visit was to set a pattern for all those to come. They were always announced in advance, there was something ceremonious and constrained about them, and they always left Josephine in a state of deep depression. End quote. We then get information of the proxy wedding of Marie-Louis and Napoleon in Vienna. The Archduke Charles stands in for the absent Napoleon. Intimate scenes and conversations are shown between Napoleon and Marie-Louis, Fast forwarding, then we see Napoleon holding his son, the infant king of Rome, to the cheering multitude below. Standing beside him are Marie-Louis, his mother, and the entourage. The plot once more refocuses on Russia and the narrator indicating the geopolitical situation at the time. The script reads, quote, By 1810, relations between France and Russia were wearing thin. The terms Russia ag had agreed to at Tilsit three years earlier were proving to be unrealistic and ruinous to her. All of this would set the scene for Napoleon's Russian campaign. The script reading, maps and books are everywhere. Napoleon is on his hands and knees, creeping around on a huge map of Russia. The narrator says that the showdown with Russia now is inevitable. It shows Napoleon determined to strike down the Russian army and go for Moscow. The narrator says, quote, With his army of 400,000 men in concealed bivouacs on a 10-mile front in the forests, bordering the banks of the Vistula River, Napoleon conducted a last-minute personal reconnaissance, disguised in the uniform of a Polish lancer, end quote. 
There is then a metaphoric scene with Napoleon's horse stumbling, Napoleon himself falling. He lightens the mood by making a joke and saying, quote, Well, this is an ill omen indeed. Caesar would probably turn back. End quote. Foreshadowing plays a key role here, knowing in hindsight the result of the Russian campaign from Napoleon. The horse symbolizes his army, which stumbles, with Napoleon the emperor falling, only for him to eventually get up. The narrator as well seems concerned, saying, quote, The campaign of 1812 was the first time in which Napoleon had marked superiority of numbers, but in accumulating such a mass of uneven quality, he would defeat his object, which was to bring about another Austerlitz or Friedland. End quote. The narrator goes on to say that Alexander ordered his army to withdraw, blow up bridges, raise villages, and anything of use for the French army. Despite constant movement, there were fierce skirmishes between the French advance guard and the Russian rear one. The narrator initially paints a grim pessimistic image for the Russians, saying, As Napoleon approached Moscow, at the court of St. Petersburg, was in despair, and the Tsar, his resolve shaken, was ready to sue for peace. Now the inter intervention of one man, Count Fyodor Vasilievich Rostopchin, the governor of Moscow, would have a decisive effect on the course of history. He delivers a prophetic speech. Napoleon does indeed take Moscow, only for it to be engulfed in fire shortly afterwards. There's a lengthy dialogue shown between Tsar Alexander and General Kutuzov, more prudent than Rostopchin. Kutuzov predicts Napoleon's withdrawal to Poland. In the meantime, back at the Kremlin balcony during the day, the script reads that it is a fine fall day. Napoleon and a small entourage are having lunch outside on a balcony overlooking Moscow. The narrator proceeds to say, quote, Day after day, a fine autumn weather was allowed to slip away while Napoleon waited for the word from Alexander, which would never come. The weather was so fine and the temperature so mild that it seemed as if even the season was conspiring to deceive Napoleon. End quote. Furthermore, the narrator says, quote, Napoleon was extremely superstitious and retained a mystical belief in his partnership with fate, a sense that he could only do so much and that events must somehow complete the decision. And so it would be in Moscow where, without confidence and full of apprehension, he would cheerlessly pursue his destiny, unaware that fortune, which had so often smiled upon him, had now abandoned his cause just when he required miracles of her. Narrator proceeds again and says, it was not only until October 20th that Napoleon withdrew the Grand Army from Moscow to begin their thousand-mile march into oblivion, end quote. Kubrick would move on to show that Napoleon had waited far too long and the brutal retreat was poignantly described by the narrator and filmography, a spoken and visual explanation of technicalities required to retreat such a large army. The narrator says, quote, But by November 5th, the temperature was down to minus 30 degrees of frost and 30,000 French horses were dead. They were not bred to endure such cold and not being properly shot for ice had no chance to survive in these conditions. End of quote. The Russian campaign was an unmitigated disaster that tore mo most of his army. The narrator moves fast forwards to 1814, saying, quote, On January 1st, 1814, France itself was invaded. Now, with a small army of raw recruits, Napoleon would have to face the powerful combination of England, Russia, Prussia, and Austria, operating against him together for the first time. The balance of numbers was tilted irretrievably against him. In a following voiceover, Napoleon says, A year ago, 
the whole of Europe was marching alongside of us. Today, the whole of Europe is marching against us. The Battle of Paris in 1814 is shown leading to the first fall of Napoleon, with the narrator concluding, In defeat, Napoleon would be punished by the kings of Europe according to a standard which they would not have applied to each other. He might marry the niece of Marie Antoinette and call himself an emperor, but that did not make him one. The next chapter would be entitled Elba, and it would say, The Treaty of Fontainebleau on April 11th, 1814, signed by his allies and Napoleon, in return for his abdication from the throne of France, gave him the token sovereignty of the tiny island of Elba, with the title of emperor, a yearly income of 2 million francs, and an army of 700, with a navy of three ships. But in 10 months' time, even this tiny stake would be sufficient capital to bring this most reckless of all gambles back into the game for a final breathtaking spin of the wheel, end quote. The script lets us know that Napoleon finds out about the death of Josephine, which occurred on the 29th of May, 1814, for a conversation with Bertrand. The narrator goes on to say, quote, when Louis XVIII returned to Paris in 1814, he was an, as unknown in France as an Egyptian pharaoh, Marked by clumsiness and disdain, he quickly proved that the Bourbon dynasty had learned nothing and forgotten nothing. People said that he did not return to the throne of his ancestors, but simply ascended to the throne of Bonaparte. By 1815, the army and the people were ready to rise against him and welcome the return of Napoleon. Napoleon set sail from Elba on February 26, 1815 with his small force of 700 soldiers, while the governor of the island, Sir Neil Campbell, was away in Florence. He put his soldiers to work, writing out his proclamations in longhand. With Napoleon being restored, the movie moves towards Waterloo. We are informed by the script that, quote, On the morning of June 18th, Napoleon, with 74,000 men, faced Wellington with 67,000 on a battlefield near the village of Mount Saint-Jean, 10 miles south of Brussels. Confident that the Prussians were out of action or contained by Grouchy's pursuing cavalry, Napoleon's only fear was that Wellington would retreat. End quote. We get a very detailed account of the battle with many animated maps. Napoleon would be defeated once more and removed from France as shown in the last chapter or title called Saint Helena. The last chapter starts with an exterior of a deck ship during the day. The script reads, quote, Napoleon on the deck of the Northumberland, looking at the cliffs of Saint Helena. He is depressed by the mass of bare volcanic granite rising steepingly out of the sea barely 28 miles in circumference, end quote. The script would give details of his last years, his illness, and ultimately his death, with the narrator saying, quote, Napoleon died on May 5th, 1821. Hudson Lowe insisted the inscription on the tomb should read Napoleon Bonaparte. In the end, it was left nameless, end quote. The movie ends with a scene with an aging Letizia, mother of Napoleon, who would pass away in February 1836. The script reads and takes us to the interior of Letizia's bedroom in Rome during the day. Quote, his mother, dressed in black, sits alone, a study of gloom and lament. The shutters are closed and the semi-darkness of the room is broken by bright slivers of sunlight. The camera moves slowly away from Letizia to an opened portmanteau. It is filled with very old children's things, faded toys, torn picture books, wooden soldiers, and the teddy bear Napoleon slept with as a child. And that is how the scene and the whole movie 
fades out. Here we get a very sad and one can say tragic ending, closing with the opening scene, one can say, where we saw Napoleon as a child, innocent, a child who became one of history's most remarkable generals, leaders, a figure so deeply ingrained in French and European history. It's remarkable how much Stanley Kubrick was able to condense in one movie, albeit three hours long, covering Napoleon's entire life, personal military career, his origins, the rise and fall and demise. We are lucky to have this script available, showing us what Stanley Kubrick wanted to do with this cinematic project, hopefully in the form of a series or a series of movies, we will be able to see it translated to the small screens or large screens. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Wanderer's History Podcast about the script, plot, and story of Stanley Kubrick's Napoleon movie. Please consider dropping a like and hitting the subscribe button if you haven't done so already. Every single bit helps. Until then, and the next time, all the best. Bye.